Hey, it's absolutely wonderful to be here with all of you, uh, to get to meet some of you. I tell you, I could have hardly imagined 30 years, no, 35 years ago. Uh, we had uh, become Christians before that, but we hadn't been involved in any kind of ministry, and we were in a church, and we started feeling like God was calling us. And uh, <clears throat> I found this radio station, and uh, it became my all-time favorite station. 35 years ago, this program, I would turn it on every day, and I would hear that familiar refrain, God is on the throne, and prayer changes things. You could have said that with me, couldn't you? Uh, I absolutely loved it, and I could not hardly have imagined that, uh, you know, these many years later that I would be standing here in Bristol, Virginia, with the Southwest Radio Church and be able to do shows with legendary figures like Noah Hutchings, and uh, what a character and a cool guy he is, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. He has made me laugh. I'm telling you, he has got some of the greatest stories. And now I've got the, the new one where he uh, wouldn't marry that woman, that Arab woman, so it cost him $5 for the tea. But he has got some of the greatest stories. Uh, man, I don't know if he ever told you the one about the dignitary that was supposed to come out of the elevator and the guy that was a little bit mentally handicapped and naked came out of it instead. Uh, if you haven't heard that story, get him to tell it to you because I'm telling you what. Uh, all those years of ministry. But what I did not know, in fact, I had uh, asked um, Larry Spargamino earlier, how many years has Noah Hutchings been working with the Southwest Radio Church? Because I told my wife last night, I said, I am certain that 35 years ago, every day it was Noah Hutchings, David Weber, and Emil Gaverlock. Remember? And so uh, I bought Noah's book, Prophecy in Stone. And until my house burned down in January, I had an original version from almost 35 years ago of Prophecy in Stone. I had a boxes full of the gospel truth. I mean, I was a devotee, right? I thought these guys were so far ahead of their time. And I'll tell you that I believe today that the ministry of Southwest Radio Church has never been more needed than it is today. There are very few true, blue, Bible-believing, prophetic ministries around anymore. And yet, look at the world. We have never more needed prophetic ministries than what we do today. So thank God for the Southwest Radio Church. Uh, and I sure hope and pray that you will uh, give them all of your support. I told these guys a moment ago, you better keep a close arm on that volume because it might take you a little while to calibrate me. Now, just before we get started, and I've had people tell me in the past that sometimes I get to talking too fast. My response to that used to be, just make your ears hear me fast. But some people said that didn't work anyway, so I will try to get through what I want to talk about tonight, and uh, hopefully won't talk too fast, won't talk too slow, won't bore you to death. But I do have to tell you this secret. You want to know a secret? Uh, when Noah was thinking about this year's Bristol Conference, they wanted to make it the best that it had ever been before. And so Noah got together with uh, all the staff there at the Southwest Radio Church, and he said, what can we do to make the Bristol event the best one that it's ever been before? And so they talked a little while, and Noah said, I know what we will do. We will call, and we will invite the most knowledgeable man in America to come and to present at this year's Bristol Conference. And so Noah went, and he called the most knowledgeable man in America. Unfortunately, he declined. So Noah went back to his staff, and he said, now what are we going to do? If we cannot have the most knowledgeable man in America, they talked for a moment. He said, I know what we'll do. We will call, and we will invite the most articulate speaker in the United States to come and to speak this year at, in Bristol. So Noah rushed to the phone, and he called the most articulate speaker in America. Unfortunately, he declined. So Noah went back. Now he's discouraged. He said, if we cannot have the most knowledgeable man in the United States, and if we cannot have the most articulate speaker in America, what are we going to do? He said, oh, I know what we will do. We will call and we will invite the most handsome man in America. And of course, I accepted. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Brother Hoggard, as you might know, the main reason that I did was I just couldn't bring myself to turn poor Noah down three times in a row like that. So I accepted. 
Uh, and for those of you that don't know that's a joke, I assure you it is. I am not the most arrogant man on the planet. Uh, well, hopefully you found that to be funny because what I want to talk to you about tonight really isn't very funny. Um, in fact, it's quite frightening, uh, but I believe it's very prophetic. Now, I don't deal in fear, but I do deal in prophecy. And I happen to know the God who can alleviate fear when you're educated about the issues and you know who to take it to in prayer, right? Somebody could say amen. There's enough of you old Baptist in here. Somebody ought to say amen. Yeah, there you go. And uh, so what I want to talk to you about is the coming technological singularity. I want to talk to you about transhumanism. I want to talk to you about the coming human enhancement revolution. For those of you that may not understand what I mean when I use the term transhumanism, I am talking about a very broad cultural movement that is growing like lightning in academia, in halls of education, in U.S. government agencies, in DARPA, in the Department of De Defense, in the U.S. Pentagon, among the Jasons, among the Brookings Institute, among academia around the world, in this country, at uh, Stanford University, Oxford University, all are committing huge amounts of resources and now your tax dollars towards a vision what is transhumanism? It is the idea that we are going to use technology now to create a new version of ourselves. We have the power. We have the tools. Six million dollar man, give me a break. We're going to realign our genetics. We are going to change ourselves. What we are now doing with genetically modified crops, what we are now doing with genetically modified animals, we are going to do with humans, 2.0, a new version of man, an improvement over what God did, they say, and we're going to do it very quickly. Noah told you earlier about Time Magazine's interview with Mr. Singularity himself, Ray Kurzweil, uh, and talking about how mankind will become immortal within the next couple of decades. Well, let me tell you, they believe that vision. There are among them utopians. There are also among them some who are dystopians and who believe this could lead to the eradication of all life on earth, and yet we're committed to it anyway. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about for the next little bit. Now, I heard earlier today when, uh, I think it might have been Bob Glaze, maybe, or maybe it was Larry Spargamino. Somebody was asking where different people had come from, and there were some of you here that said you came from Ohio, right? It's basically sitting in the same area. Were you there uh, last year at the Science and Supernatural Conference in Ohio? Well, I spoke there, and I was quite certain that most Ohioans uh, were completely unaware that right there in their state, in recent years, Nearly a million dollars. Here's the headline, by the way, right there. Actually, there's the medical news today. Press release right there. Case Law School, that's a law school that's in Ohio, receives $773,000 NIH. That's the National Institute of Health. That's the largest department in the United States that doles out your tax dollars for health-related research. They gave a grant of almost a million dollars to uh, this uh, fellow right here, Professor Maxwell Melman at the Case Law School, Western Reserve University, almost a million dollars for one purpose ladies and gentlemen, and that is to uh, begin creating the guidelines that will be used for establishing public policy, that is the law, and how will the law be extended towards human non-humans, in other words, humans that are genetically different than you and I, and will they be protected by the U.S. Constitution, will they be protected by the Bill of Rights, because they are not humans who have received inalienable rights like our Constitution says we have from our Creator. These are new creations. We'll talk more about that perhaps in a little bit, in a little while if I don't run out of time, and if I see Noah walk over here and start approaching me, then I know I'm running out of time. But that was specifically what this grant was given for. Now, I had been looking for the finality of this report. Uh, Professor Melman led a team of 24, uh, uh, over a 24-month period of law professors, bioethicists, geneticists, uh, other interested parties who were qualified and could be part of that team for the express purpose of developing the guidelines so that the government will know under what conditions we can begin to genetically alter the human race for the next step in human evolution 
then also the next step in uh, medicine, it says, according to the report in there somewhere, genetic uh, alterations of humans. And so I waited for the report. The report was not forthcoming. Uh, they concluded this report about eight, or this research about 18 months ago. But whereas I have not yet been able to find the report that was supposed to come forward, I did notice this: that Professor Maxwell Melman, who led this research, uh, left Case Law School, began traveling the United States of America, and right now he's going to uh, colleges and universities, and he's giving two lectures. One is called uh, "Directed." Evolution, Public Policy and Enhancement, and the second is called Transhumanism and the Future of Democracy. So guess what, ladies and gentlemen, there is a plan, and it is unfolding, and it is unfolding quickly, and your tax dollars are being used to fund the very scheme that is going to be used to recalibrate humanity. But if you're sitting in this building, and you might happen to be a little bit envious of those Ohioans, Never fear, the spring 2010 University of Virginia magazine on reinventing life. Um, how far is the University of Virginia, by the way, from here? Anybody know? Long way, two, three hundred miles. Oh, so it doesn't affect you in Bristol? Well, guess what? Do some research and you'll find out that farms around you are raising genetically modified crops, genetically modified animals. It isn't just, by the way, it isn't just uh, Virginia. It isn't just Ohio. This is happening in every state in the United States right now. In the state that I come from, Missouri, we're raising genetically modified pigs that have human organs and have human DNA running inside these pigs for the purposes of xenotransplantation. But why I liked this Virginia article was uh, it's 2000, it's the spring edition from 2010, so it's not quite a year ago that they put this out, uh, but it's quite a lengthy article. You ought to Google this and go get the 2010 spring edition. You can get it from the University of Virginia's website, download it, and read this particular edition because it is all about how we have been genetically modifying organisms, but we are going to genetically modifying humans, and it's going to happen quickly. Professor Michael Schertz, who is the professor of chemical engineering at the uh, University of Virginia, he says it is going to happen. We're going to change human DNA. Who doesn't want to be stronger, thinner, healthier? We need to start figuring out right now how to lay down the rules so that it is used in the most beneficial ways possible. That's what everybody is saying. We've got to develop the rules so that we can make sure that uh, as we begin creating a new form of Nephilim, a new watcher's technology, uh, that we do this so that we become the good little demigods that we are are supposed to be, uh, what? For what purpose? I don't know, to rise up and challenge God? I think this is what we're doing. You know, here's the thing that kind of gets me, and I apologize, I do tend to jump around, and so hopefully you won't get mad and start throwing stuff at me. Um, what does God know that we don't know? Besides a lot, what does he know that we don't know? Why did God put barriers between the species? Why did he order that each kind reproduce after its own kind? And what will man now do in its arrogance as we begin combining ourselves with animals and other synthetic forms of life? We could literally release a kind of prion contamination across species disease for which humanity has absolutely no defenses. It could be a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. It could be a plague of new black death upon the earth. But we are racing into this technology as fast as we possibly can. And you and I, ladies and gentlemen, are already eating genetically modified foods. Uh, in Britain, uh, 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 where the brother was speaking from just a moment ago, and he, uh, he just barely touched on how they're creating ge genetically modified monstrosities over there. Genetic chimeras that are part human, part animal for research purposes. This is happening. They've created humans in Britain that have three genetic parents. They're creating designer children. It's happening there. It's coming here. And as Professor Schertz says, it is going to happen. Whenever the technology exists, we use it, period. We're going to use it. But I, I found later on in his article, if you read it, something very interesting. Uh, he says, uh, when scientists first start working with human DNA, he's talking about when we actually start genetically altering humans. If you read the article, that's what he's talking about. We are going to botch it. 
with both immediate and long-term consequences. In biological systems as complex as humans, there will be mistakes and unintended side effects when DNA is modified. There will be mutations that will have extreme consequences for the individuals in which they appear. Most mutations are harmful, certainly not like X-Men, end quote. And of course, Pastor Hoggins, you know why he's referring to X-Men, because he's a college professor, and he's talking to what Rush Lim Limbaugh calls those young skulls full of mush. And those young skulls full of mush right now are being indoctrinated in the school, uh, right across the road from here, the movie's playing right now with Thor. The gods are coming down. We're going to be converted. We're all going to be very cool. Uh, oh, sure, there'll be some bad X-Men, but us good X-Men, we're going to overcome them. In the end, we're going to win out. If you don't believe it, watch Wolverine, right? At the end of the day, we win. Uh, and that's what this generation is buying into. There's a new poll out now that says 75% of people under the age of 25 have had their worldview more shaped by Star Wars movies than they have Christian churches. This generation is being sold into something, ladies and gentlemen, and it is not going to end well. And I believe that it is probably the, the billion-pound elephant standing in the middle of most prophecy circles that are too afraid to even touch this subject matter, saying, when is somebody going to pay attention to me because we are entering into the days of Noah. We are entering into a period of time where the world, where, where the Bible says men's hearts are going to fail them for fear for seeing those things that are coming upon the earth. We're entering into it. Oh, okay, well, you may say this, but surely, Tom, these are just isolated news stories, right? You've seen preachers that do that. Spend eight days trying to find one headline to support their proof text. You know, search and search. I've got to have something that will make what I'm talking about sound like it's real. So did you do that, Tom? Did you go out and just grab a couple of headlines? Uh, listen, I could, I, I could honestly, not exaggerating, I could spend 10 hours standing here thumbing through news stories out of the last 24 months. But let me just show you a few of the headlines that are both, they're news stories from reputable news sources. Some of these are from U.S. government and European government reports that are recent reports. Uh, some of these are from peer-reviewed medical journals. But let's just have a very fast look at some of these. Here's the 2010 newest State of the Future report from the Millennium Project. If you don't know who the Millennium Project is, very important. They were formed out of the United Nations a few years back. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution, the Futures Group International, the American Council for the UNU. They're global futurists. They basically predict the future for uh, GMOs, for governments, whoever needs information. That's what they do. They're among the elite of the scientific community. You can Google this at uh, uh, you can Google this at Google. Say, I told you I was educated. You can go to Google and you can Google this. I, had to, I got a doctorate from somewhere. I just can't remember where. You can Google this. You can download this report, repeat it, uh, read it for yourself because it's got a lot of very important information in it. But here was what uh, part of what leaped out at me is when they begin talking about the genetic uh, human genetic revolution that is coming, the human enhancement revolution. And they start talking about, quote, as computer code is written to create software to augment human capabilities, so to genetic code will be written to create life forms to augment human civilization. We're going to become the Borg because the military is heavily invested in I investing in what is called BMI technology, brain machine interfacing. That's partly what they're referring to. We're writing the software code right now so that the software will help us augment ourselves by being able to interface with artificial intelligence systems. We're already doing it. In fact, the technology is rolling out so quickly that you might have saw where some of the games makers now are creating this little thing. It's like this, actually. It's a lot like this thing. You wear it on your head, and extracranially, it is reading the neural impulses of your brain so that you can control a game system just by looking at the a screen and thinking about it. You have saw the research where they have racist monkeys and they've opened up their cranium and they put a chip in their brain and they can control a cursor. Well, we're way past that. The military, some of the most recent reports from the military, they're talking about Terminator technology where within the next 24 months, they're going to be field testing a device no bigger than a Bluetooth that a soldier can wear above their ear so that soldiers can communicate with the form 
form of synthetic telekinesis. They'll be able to communicate with each other from battlefield to various things. They'll, crow, they'll control robotic devices, drones, uh, robotic tanks, just by thinking about it. You might have saw the story this week. They're creating the helmet right now that will allow them to visualize the battlefield at great distances and by thinking about it, tell these drones where to go and what to do. Well, it takes software to help these machine devices break down the neural processes of the brain. The brain's secret language uh, has been very complex. This is why DARPA, many other military agencies have invested literally billions of dollars over the last few decades trying to decipher the secret language of our brain waves. Well, they're getting very close now. They've created the algorithms and now they're being able to read this code. They'll parse it down into computers where it is translated into digital code which then forms words and commands. It can then be picked up on the other side. Matter of fact, two humans just communicated with, with each other, one in Europe and one here, telekinetically using two computer devices and this device that's being uh, tested by the uh, government. Well, what they're saying is, as computer code is written to create software to augment human capabilities, it is going to outpace us normal humans. We're no longer going to be able to adapt. I mean, we may need something else. We may need eight arms. We may need uh, some other kind of organism that is not natural to humans. And as we begin creating the Borg, we're going to need to create genetic code that will be written to create life forms to augment civilization. This from the 2010 State of the Future report. Hey, here's the mail online. Back to Britain again. Your children will live to see man merge with machines. But... Will it save us or destroy us? That is the question. Here's the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Redesigning Humans, the Final Frontier. And this article, they're talking about men like Professor Gregory Stock. Gregory Stock is a brilliant man. He is working with scientists in the United States and other countries right now on what is called genetic germline engineering. Why is genetic germline engineering important? Because it's different than making a genetic alteration to an adult specimen. For instance, you've heard of gene doping. A sports figure, they get injected with particular kind of genes that will then give them performance abilities, and this is called gene doping, and it's not like the old you know, stuff that they used to take that would turn up in drug tests, so this is becoming a problem. Well, the, but with gene doping, if, if you go in to your local genetics laboratory and get injected with a bunch of genes that might help you do something, that will not be passed on to your next generation. You uh, have babies, it doesn't pass on to them. But with genetic germline engineering, it does. We make changes at the very early embryonic level. We make changes at the sperm level. We make changes at the egg level. We're already doing this. It's not a theoretical science. And what people like Professor Gregory Stock are saying is if we want to produce a better future for humans, the best way to do it is begin to genetically re-engineer humans now at these lowest possible levels, and then all offspring from them forward will forever be something different than than what humans are today. And they're very much working towards this. In fact, here he says in his own words, we know that Homo sapiens, that's you, is not the final word in primate evolution, but few have yet grasped that we are on the cusp of profound biological change, poised to transcend our current form and character on a journey to destinations of new imagination. Glory to God. Yeah, I think this was thought of once before. Uh, and by the way, uh, Pastor Hoggard is going to be talking later. Are you going to bring up the triple helix? All right, then I'm not going to steal none of your thunder, but just in case when he's talking about a triple helix, if you think he's stretching the facts, here's the scientific American triple helix designing a new molecule of life. Human evolution is not over. You didn't even know that your double helix was outdated, did you? Here you are, Chevy Chevettes and, and uh, uh, Ford Pintos, and didn't even know it. Well, your benevolent overlords are getting ready to upgrade you to Cadillacs, in their opinion. Christianity today, the techno-sapiens are coming. When God fashioned man and woman, he called his creation very good. Transhumanists say that by manipulating our bodies with microscopic tools, we can do better than God did. Hey, here's another one. And note that this is Reuters. 
one of the most respected news sources in the world, so I wanted to say that so you would know that this wasn't from weekly world news, and I didn't photocopy a tabloid magazine that I grabbed as I was heading out of the grocery store. Reuters, but here's the article, scientists want debate on animals with human genes. And then look at this first paragraph. A mouse that can speak, a monkey with Down's syndrome, Dogs with human hands or feet? British scientists want to know if such experiments are acceptable or if they go too far in the name of medical science or medical research. There's a little bit of an interesting backstory on this. Am I too loud? Am I loud enough? Am I talking too fast? Am I talking too stupid? All right. There's a little bit of a backstory here, uh, uh, in, and, uh, and Alan could even give us more on this, I'm quite certain. But in Britain, a few years back, they had what was called the embryology discussions. Now, the purpose behind the embryology discussions were there were scientists who were mostly being driven by large corporations in the pharmaceutical industry who wanted to create human-animal hybrids, human-animal chimeras, so that they could experiment on them. Uh, and the reason for doing this, you would put human enzymes inside of an animal, and now you can bypass the FDA's regulations or the British regulations on being able to use humans for experimental drugs. But if you create an animal that's got enough human genetics in it, you can do the testing on the animal, and now you can test whether that therapy that you're trying to create is working well, and then you can, you can, you know, you can speed up the process, get approval, and there's hundreds of treatments billions of dollars to be made in the genetics revolution in the genetics industry. So these guys are being driven by big corporations. They don't really care very much about life, evidently, because they're, they're blending humans and animals. Uh, they want to get public funds in Britain. They want uh, tax dollars from Britain to fund their experiments. Uh, some of the people in Britain didn't like that very much, especially the pro-life community. So they started complaining about it. So Britain, either sincerely or what pretensively, I don't know, decided that they would have what they called the embryology discussions. And so they would allow experts to come in from all these different fields to talk to them about the pros, the cons, the ethics of creating human-animal chimeras, people from within the industry. They allowed clergy. There were two uh, bishops from the Vatican that went there. One of the bishops said, well, if a woman participates in, the, uh, in giving egg or ovum, to be used in these experiments for creating these human-animal hybrids. Uh, and then later, if she developed a crisis of conscience, she ought to be able to raise that offspring as her own child. Uh, this is what the bishop from the Vatican said. Well, anyway, the embryology discussions went along. Uh, the government finally decided they were going to dole out this money on a case-by-case -case basis, which pretty much means they've been funding everything that anybody wanted to do over there. Uh, and uh, under the pretense of, you know, being fair and balanced, which is kind of an American term, Alan. But um, uh, so they, they've been funding this, and now these same scientists are back. And what they're saying is, okay, we've been doing this and we're, we're, we're supposedly destroying these human-animal concoctions at a very early age or at the embryonic age. But now what we want to know is would the, government, would the public be willing to continue funding this research? And now let us set up some islands of Dr. Moreau so we can start raising these monstrosities to full maturity so that we can do even better experiments. And that's what they're wanting to ask. And furthermore, if you go Google this article and you read it, you'll see that the scientists scientists in this uh, uh, press release are, um, come very close to admitting that some of their colleagues are already doing it anyway, and so the public might as well go ahead with the program. There's, you know, there's, there's a few theories. One of them is called the law of diminishing returns, where the public, if you went to the public here in America and said, hey, we want to start creating some half cow, half humans that we can use for target practice out in the middle of the field in Missouri, uh, what do you think? Most of the public is going to say no. Even the crazy ones are going to say no. But you get them used to something happening at a in, a, in a laboratory setting, out of sight, out of mind. Your dollars are flowing into stem cell sciences. George Bush tried to put an end to this, by the way. Uh, I had some problems with George Bush, but I voted for him, George W. Bush. Uh, and in a State of the Union address, I think it was in 
uh, 2006, I believe, he called for legislation for prohibiting the creation of human animal chimeras and other patentable forms of humans. That's how, that's how far the science was advancing then. Well, he put limitations on how the stem cells could be used. One of the first things that Obama did was he raised those limitations, and that's been in the news, but he wants, the, he wants these scientists, these kind of scientists, to fully be able to do exactly that, create dogs with human hands and feet, create mice that have fully developed human brains. A Stanford University in California already created mice with 10% human brains, and the, uh, the panel at Stanford University has already approved the next step in that to create mice with 100% human brains. And two of the former... Uh, 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 members of the President's Council on Bioethics wrote articles about it where they were talking about what, what if this mouse becomes humanized? What if this mouse suddenly begins questioning, who am I? Is there a God? Well, you have become a God. You can't just create something, then wipe it out. I mean, this is not the way God deals with nature, is it? And if we're going to play God, then we have to take the role of God. That's what their argument was back to the Stanford University. Well, in any case, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, this thing is so far out of the box, but dogs with human hands and feet kind of reminds me of a story. Want to hear a story? Want to hear a story? There was a Baptist, and he wanted to have a Baptist dog. Not just no normal dog, he wanted a Baptist dog, by golly, and he was a Baptist preacher, so he was pretty adamant about it. And uh, so him and his wife got to looking around, finally one day, somehow, somewhere, they found a kennel that specialized in religious dogs. So he went to the kennel. He said, I want a Baptist dog and no other kind of a dog. And the man brought out Fido, and he said, that's the best Baptist dog I got right there. So the preacher looked at him, and he said, fetch a Bible. This dog rushed off, came back a few minutes later, and Noah, he not only had a Bible, he had a King James version of the Bible. <laughs> Whoo! The woman looked down at the dog, and she said, hmm, turn to Psalm 78. The dog leaped down with great dexterity, began with his paw, turned right to the book, Psalm 78. They said, we're having this dog. That's the best Baptist dog I ever saw. They bought the Baptist dog, took the Baptist dog home. Called their friends to come over, said, man, you have got to come and see this Baptist dog. So the friends came over, and they're running him through the rituals. Go get a King James Bible, turn to this book of the Bible, turn to that book of the Bible. And one of the friends said, yeah, but can he do regular dog tricks? You know, like roll over, speak, heal, that kind of stuff. The Baptist said, mm, I don't know, I hadn't thought about that. So he looked at the dog, and he said, heal. The dog leaped into the air. The dog slowly began floating towards him, extending his hand, and started to speak in a funny language. And the Baptist grabbed him out of the air and said, those dirty rats sold me a Pentecostal dog. <laughs> the Washington Post of mice, men, and in-between scientists debate blending of human and animal forms. Merely human, the New York Times, merely human, that's so yesterday. Monsters, Inc., the Pentagon plan to create mutant super soldiers, a counterpunch. Here's the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity, the future of the human species, Discovery News. Somebody was telling me earlier about blood now being used for creating circuitry, and I said, I know what you're talking about, and this it reminded me of this slide. Part human, part machine, transistors devised. Here's the danger room again. Pentagon looks to breed immortal synthetic organisms, molecular kill switch included. They're trying to figure out how to get around cellular death. They want immortal life, but they don't want to have to get it from God. Hey, here was an interesting article. Top Pentagon scientists br a fear brain-modified foes. Why this article was interesting to me, although this one came out about three years ago, but this was the first one in which we learned that the Jasons, who are the Jasons? The Jasons are the celebrated scientists on the Pentagon's most prestigious scientific advisory panel. That's about all you'll ever know about the Jasons. They're highly guarded, but they are considered to be among the elite minds in the world, uh, and they uh, offer advice to the Pentagon, to the Department of Defense, to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, but they had created a report that was supposed to be a for your eyes only to the Pentagon in which they were dis detailing how that the human enhancement revolution is going to be the next arms race and it's going to be here within 24 months. 
That was leaked by Secrecy News to Wired Magazine who created that article. Well, here's Discovery News. Discovery News looked into the genetics revolution, genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, neuropharmacology, just a lot of stuff that ends with the phrase ology, and how that that in the hands of the transhumanists is, quote, the most dangerous idea in the world. Professor Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama, a celebrated scientist, took it even further. He said it is the most dangerous idea in the history of mankind, and it could this century lead to the extinction of the human race. Well, we're back to Virginia. Virginia Journal of Law and Technology, patentability of extinct organisms regenerated through cloning. And yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. They're talking about bringing back to life organisms, living things that have been dead for millennia. And we have no idea what they could do in this environment, but we're going to bring them back anyway. We're back to Virginia number two, the University of Virginia. Virginia team wins bronze medal in genetically engineered machines competition. The reason I put this one on there is so that you would see um, how fast the genetics revolution is becoming ho-hum and every day the creation of new novel forms of life, things that God did not create and that have never been on the earth before, uh, is now, for the past four years, the iGEM competition, the genetically engineered machine competition, uh, has been a basis of our colleges and universities across the nation and college kids. Uh, they're getting gene sequencers, and they're creating new forms of life that do things that have never existed in history. And these are living organisms. These are, these are creatures. They are alive. And they do things that have never existed on Earth. And it's becoming so every day that now the college kids are competing to create new novel forms of life that actually will do things. That's why they call them a machine. And this last year, the Virginia team won the bronze medal. Here's back to Virginia number three, Virginia Journal of Law and Technology, moving beyond gene doping preparing for genetic modification in sport. And basically what they're saying is it's going to start on the battlefield. It's going to very quickly move into the culture at large. It'll, it'll begin in sport. We'll begin genetically modifying those sports figures and our heroes and the rest of it. And then for those of you who can afford it, you too can be genetically modified. There are hundreds more similar news and peer-reviewed articles on the coming human enhancement revolution. Here's an article at The Wired magazine. We're going to create hiberna hibernating soldiers by blending them with zombie pigs. Here's another one out of the UK. We're going to create living brains inside machines. This one I wish would have turned out a little clearer. This is only May 11th. So this is just a few days ago on the post-genetic code. What they're saying is we've spent uh, the last couple of decades mapping the human genetic code, but now as we begin genetically re or altering humanity, we are going to move into the post-genetic code period. Here again in DARPA's Danger Room, Crowdsource Intel Edit DNA. That's in this year's DARPA's budget has millions of dollars set aside for editing soldiers' DNA, for changing them genetically. Here's an article from Raiders News network just a few days ago. Professor of human genetics at the University of Chicago has no doubt genetically engineered humans will trigger a new species of man. Here we are at the New York Times uh, three days ago. We are entering the hybrid age. And what the New York Times was talking about is we, we had the Bronze Age. Uh, we had the Industrial Age. We had the information age, which we're just now uh, coming out of when the internet was invented and all that. And now we are entering the hybrid age, the age in which everything, dogs, cats, food, humans, every living thing is going to be hybridized. Well, how soon before the human enhancement revolution is widespread? About, uh, about the same amount of time as when I run out of time on giving this lecture. Uh, all of the government reports are saying after the year 2012, all bets are off. You can download this article, Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance. It's almost 500 pages long. You ought to download it. You ought to read it because you paid for it. This was a taxpayer-funded uh, report, and it came out about 10 years ago. What, and the reason I put this here is because it illustrated that the government has known for at least over a decade that the human enhancement revolution was coming. And then, as a matter of fact, this article, see these abbreviations, nano, bio, info, cogno. If you read this, they've got bullet points 
graphs. They've got charts and graphs in there. They speculated how that within a decade, here's how we're going to begin altering the human race. Well, uh, they were exactly right. Beyond the year 2012, here's DARPA's Department of Defense fiscal year 2011 budget page that I took out of the page so that you would see for yourself bio design. We are going to create an immortal form of life. It's in this year's budget. This is the 2011 presidential uh, DARPA budget. Uh, we are going to create an immortal militarized form of life. In fact, DARPA is so concerned about the creation of this new form of life that uh, they sound to me like they're um, confused because they want a kill switch put in it. First question that popped into my mind is how do you kill something that's immortal? Well, maybe they want to put it to sleep, but they're so concerned with this militarized new form of life falling into the hands of our enemies and then being used against us or getting out of control and turning on us on its own that they want, uh, they want constraints against it. Uh, if, you, if you get the 2011 DARPA budget, you'll actually see language in there. This is a quote, editing a soldier's DNA. There's millions of dollars in there for the altering of humans. Well, Time Magazine, uh, Noah referred to it earlier, February, they looked into DARPA's programs, they looked into to human enhancement. They interviewed Mr. Ray Kurzweil, Mr. Singularity himself, and they determined that the year 2045 is the year that man becomes immortal, that it is not only inevitable, it is imminent, but some believe the new man is going to be here even sooner, and they're preparing for it. Our military is preparing for it. In fact, the Jasons, in their most recent update, have told uh, the Department of Defense that they now have less than 18 months to get ahead of this technology. What I'd like to know is what the Jasons know that we don't know. What do they know about what China may be doing or what Russia may be doing or what's happening in Asia or some other country that could potentially be our enemy? Why would the Jasons? This is not the lunatic fringe. These are the most celebrated scientists that work with our intelligence communities. Why would they be telling the Department of Defense, you have got to get ahead of this technology now, and if you wait even 18 months, you will fall unrecoverably, that's their words, unrecoverably behind in this next arms race. So, some are preparing for it now. At the Birkbeck Law School, at the Birkbeck Law School and University, are you familiar with the Birkbeck School? No. Well, in any case, this is one of the world's leading law schools. I was asking Alan, by the way, sorry. Uh, where they prepare st students who want careers in uh, criminal law. And uh, the Birkbeck Law School put out a press release not long ago, and guess what they were talking about? The need in the near future to create new classes for guess what? Trying to analyze a crime scene perpetrated by a human non-human. And the whole point was everything we know about forensics. 200 years of developing a science called crime scene investigation is getting ready to be challenged because if the perpetrator of a violent rape, rape scene where a woman is found who was raped and murdered by a, by a serial rapist was the activity of a man who is part wolf, there might not be anything we understand about forensics that would apply to this character, not his instincts, not his possible bloodlust. And the fact that these kind of questions are having to be asked was actually illustrated in experiments that were done by Evan Balaban at the McGill University uh, in Montreal, Canada in the last few years where he took the developing brains of quail and he transferred it into the developing brains of chickens and as the chickens grew and developed they started exhibiting the head bobs and the vocal trills of quail and what his simple experiment illustrated was that very complex behavior patterns can be transferred from one species to another species when we begin to modify what it means uh, to be a human. At the American Journal of Law and Medicine, they're wishing that we could have a literal uh, international treaty prohibiting cloning and inheritable alterations. It isn't going to happen. Uh, but why did they want it? Because the new species or post-human, by the way, this is a peer-reviewed medical journal. Uh, the new uh, post-human will likely view the old normal humans as inferior, even savages, and fit for slavery or slaughter. The normals, on the other hand, may see the post-humans as a threat, and if they can, may engage in a preemptive strike by killing the post-humans before they themselves are killed or enslaved by them. It is ultimately this predictable potential for genocide that makes species-altering experiments potential 
chemical weapons of mass destruction and makes the unaccountable genetic engineer a potential bioterrorist. How real is this threat in California? They have been conducting a series of HFA, House Foreign Affairs Committee hearings. Senator uh, Brad Sherman, who's best known for his expertise in the spread of nuclear weapons among terrorists, has been chairing these meetings in California. And what are they about? <coughs> they are about the the future, near future potential threat of superhumans, <coughs> super animals, and super artificial intelligence that could form uh, a lethal threat against which mankind is not prepared. But it gets worse. Here's the new Jason's report. Uh, Google this, download it, and read it. If you want some interesting reading, the $100 genome, implications for the Department of Defense. This is only a four-month-old report. They talk about the coming human enhancement revolution and, and the militarizing of human genetics. Uh, and then under major recommendation, they begin talking about how the DOD has to get ahead of this. They talk about the need to establish genotype and phenotype data. And here's that a phrase I was quoting a moment ago, waiting even two years that would be next December 2012. To initiate this process may replace them, that is the Department of Defense, unrecoverably behind in the race for personal genomics information and application. But these hot words, genotype and phenotype, if you remember your basic biology, and I'll make this just, this is an oversimplification, but to make it, make me understand it, it has to be over, Oversimplified. See, I can hardly even talk, let alone understand genotype and phenotype, you know what I mean? So um, genotype basically is what you are internally. This is what you inherit from your parents. This is your genetic makeup. But phenotype is how that is expressed. Uh, it's the way I walk. It's everything, really. It's more than that, but it's the way I talk. It's the way I'm, I'm bipedal. I'm a human. It's what makes me appear and look and behave and have instincts the way I do. That's the expression. That's the external expression of my internal ge uh, genetic makeup and what the Jasons are saying to the Department of Defense. As we begin changing humans, their phenotype is going to change. They are going to begin acting differently. They're going to take on animal characteristics. And we have got to now start building databases because this is the next arms race. we got to know what in the world it is we're unleashing basically on ourselves. But what the, what the Jasons recognize is there isn't going to be an international moratorium on this technology. It is going to be. Uh, uh, the United Nations has been talking about the U.S., Austria, China. They tried already to put together um, a voluntary prohibition on the development of this technology, and they all came out of it recognizing that, first of all, even if everybody agreed, some of them may be lying. They'd just develop it secretly anyway and try to use it to dominate uh, the others. And furthermore, it's going to be driven by such monstrously huge corporate interests. Like uh, the professor at the University of Virginia says, who doesn't want to be stronger? Who doesn't want to leap buildings in a single bound, you know? Who doesn't want to get up feeling better than they do? My knees clickety-clack when I go up the stairs, you know? I told my wife the other day, I said, I can't wait for DARPA to get one of those exoskeletons perfected because I'm going to step inside that thing and run down the road a little ways. Maybe kick a few transhumanists as I go by. Here's the Global Governance 2025 at a critical juncture. Download this and do read it. This is an important document. This was published in September. This is from the United States Office of the Director of National Intelligence, working with the European Institute of Security Studies. And guess what this report is about? This report primarily is about one thing. What are the triggers that could set in motion the sudden need for global government? What could suddenly set in motion the need for all of the major governments of the world to come together under one canopy under the pretense of mutual defense? That's what this report is about. And they talk about such things as the collapse of the dollar and biological warfare and a lot of other things. But then on page 35, it starts getting interesting as they start talking about new forms of human behavior and association, genetic modification of DNA at fertilization, open the possibility for designing humans with unique physical, emotional, and cognitive abilities. They're literally saying that this arms race could be the potential trigger that could set in motion the need for a global government. 
It gets worse. This is the Brookings Institute, the number one policy think tank in the world, the number one policy think tank in the United States. And they right now, this, this is happening right now, they're writing this brand new series called the Future of the Constitution Series. We, we used that term earlier, inalienable rights. That's connected to the U.S. Constitution. Basically what it means is we believe in America, the founding of this country, the way our documents were written, that we have inalienable rights that are given to us from our Creator, and those must be protected by the Bill of Rights, the U.S. Constitution, our courts, our laws, the freedom of speech, and so on. Well, what the Brookings Institute are saying is, are we going to extend those rights to humans who are not human? They're only part human. And this entire series from the number one policy think tank in the world is taking on this issue now, the future of the Constitution series with special regard to enhance human non-humans. And right here, this is a screen grab from the Brookings Institute. This was published just a few weeks back, endowed by their creator with a question mark, the future of constitutional personhood. Why is there a question mark on there if we already know that we've been endowed by these rights with our creator? Because they're not talking about that creator. They're talking about us the life forms that we are going to create, uh, things that are only partly human, will we extend to them the constitutional defenses? And, uh, and then, uh, now that's, by the way, that's uh, article, I think, number 10 in the Future of the Constitution series. This is an excerpt from uh, uh, article number 9, Reproductive Rights and Reproductive Technology. And I know I'm going to run out of time, so I won't take time to read all this. Basically, they give a scenario where two gay men fall in love in the near future, and in the near future, gay marriage is constitutionally protected. And they want to have a true genetic offspring. The two men want a child that is genetically made up of them, their two DNA. Not a man and a woman, but two men. Uh, and the technology is going to be there, but they want something more than that. They want to increase the certainty that when this child is born, it will be predisposed to being a homosexual. And so they will insert additional gay genes into the child. What, what, did you ever see the movie Gattaca? We're talking about a future gay Gattaca. The creation of genetically engineered homosexual people and and the need for, to make sure that we protect these people under the Constitution. Well, Tom, is there anything spiritual or supernatural about all this? There sure is, and I don't have any time to talk about it. We have entered an unprecedented period that I call the dawn of techno-dimensional spiritual warfare. This is the book that Noah was telling you about earlier. You can get that book from him. It's all about this subject. It has a lot more documentation in it than this uh, uh, today. But what I can tell you is, and I know this from experience, that Noah is walking this direction, and I'm going to be done very soon. We have entered into a warfare, ladies and gentlemen. We are in a war for the mind of a generation. Unlike any generation except maybe before the Great Flood, has ever experienced. I know it personally. I was attacked at the uh, Transhumanist Spiritual uh, Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah. I've been attacked on all of the number one transhumanist blog sites in the world, including those that are connected with the Singularity Institute and uh, the Singularity Summit. Uh, the co-authors of some of these science um, reports, like the NSF report, Ethics of Human Enhancement, 25 Questions and Answers, have attacked me on the largest uh, transhumanist websites in the world. Uh, so I know that we're in this battle uh, in the ideological or theological phase. I also know, uh, and even some transhumanists believe that it could be more than that, there are transhumanists themselves who believe that we are going to make contact with supernaturalism by altering our genetics. That we are going to make contact with the other side by blending ourselves with animals. I could have spent an hour just on this subject matter, all the various modes of perception and how we're going to open those modes of perception by blending ourselves with animals. Balaam's donkey tells us that some animals can see into the spirit world. And as we begin to alter ourselves, we too will be able to see into the spirit world. This brings me back to what God might know that I don't know. And Noah's getting closer at the Arizona State University, they've taken it a step further. They're already trying to make contact with the other side. Some transhumanists go even further. They believe that it is prophetic. I believe these transhumanists are on the right track. I believe that what we are doing now is a repeat of what happened in the days of Noah. We are, we, are, we are in the same Luciferian way that the watchers did. We are shaking our fist in the face of God. We are saying we will cross species barriers. We will create a new form of life into which we can extend ourselves. 
And I think that when Jesus' closest disciples, Noah said to him, tell us, what shall be the sign of thy coming of the end of the age? He gave him a series of signs. We've been talking about all of them. But then he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. Hey, brand new book coming out. Noah contributed a chapter to it. It's all about this. You can learn more at the Future Congress Conference. It's coming up July 22nd through the 34th. Noah will be there. I'll be there. Hey, it's absolutely wonderful to be here with all of you, uh, to get to meet some of you. I tell you, I could have hardly imagined 30 years, no, 35 years ago. Uh, we had uh, become Christians before that, but we hadn't been involved in any kind of ministry, and we were in a church, and we started feeling like God was calling us. And uh, <clears throat> I found this radio station. And uh, it became my all-time favorite station. 35 years ago, this program, I would turn it on every day, and I would hear that familiar refrain, God is on the throne and prayer changes things. You could have said that with me, couldn't you? Uh, I absolutely loved it, and I could not hardly have imagined that, uh, you know, these many years later, that I would be standing here in Bristol Virginia with the Southwest Radio Church and be able to do shows with legendary figures like Noah Hutchings. And uh, what a character and a cool guy he is, huh? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> he has made me laugh. I'm telling you, he has got some of the greatest stories. And now I've got the, the new one where he uh, wouldn't marry that woman, that Arab woman, so it cost him $5 for the tea. But he has got some of the greatest stories. Oh, uh, man, I don't know if he ever told you the one about the dignitary that was supposed to come out of the elevator and the guy that was a little bit mentally handicapped and naked came out of it instead. Uh, if you haven't heard that story, get him to tell it to you because I'm telling you what. Uh, all those years of ministry. But what I did not know, in fact, I had uh, asked um, Larry Spargamino earlier, how many years has Noah Hutchings been working with the Southwest Radio Church? Because I told my wife last night, I said, I am certain that 35 years ago, every day it was Noah Hutchings, David Weber, and Emil Gaverlock. Remember? And so uh, I bought Noah's book, Prophecy in Stone. And until my house burned down in January, I had an original version from almost 35 years ago of Prophecy in Stone. I had a boxes full of the gospel truth. I mean, I was a devotee, right? I thought these guys were so far ahead of their time. And I'll tell you that I believe today that the ministry of Southwest Radio Church has never been more needed than it is today. There are very few true, blue, Bible-believing, prophetic ministries around anymore. And yet, look at the world. We have never more needed prophetic ministries than what we do today. So thank God for the Southwest Radio Church. Uh, and I sure hope and pray that you will uh, give them all of your support. I told these guys a moment ago, you better keep a close arm on that volume because it might take you a little while to calibrate me. Now, just before we get started, and I've had people tell me in the past that sometimes I get to talking too fast. My response to that used to be, just make your ears hear me fast. But some people said that didn't work anyway, so I will try to get through what I want to talk about tonight, and uh, hopefully won't talk too fast, won't talk too slow, won't bore you to death. But I do have to tell you this secret. You want to know a secret? Uh, when Noah was thinking about this year's Bristol Conference, they wanted to make it the best that it had ever been before. And so Noah got together with uh, all the staff there at the Southwest Radio Church, and he said, what can we do to make the Bristol event the best one that it's ever been before? And so they talked a little while, and Noah said, I know what we will do. We will call, and we will invite the most knowledgeable man in America to come and to present at this year's Bristol Conference. 
And so Noah went and he called the most knowledgeable man in America. Unfortunately, he declined. So Noah went back to his staff and he said, now what are we going to do? If we cannot have the most knowledgeable man in America, they talked for a moment. He said, I know what we'll do. We will call and we will invite the most articulate speaker in the United States to come and to speak this year at, in Bristol. So Noah rushed to the phone and he called the most articulate speaker in America. Unfortunately, he declined. So Noah went back. Now he's discouraged. He said, if we cannot have the most knowledgeable man in the United States, and if we cannot have the most articulate speaker in America, what are we going to do? He said, oh, I know what we will do. We will call and we will invite the most handsome man in America. And of course, I accepted. <laughs> and uh, uh, Brother Hoggard, as you might know, the main reason that I did was I just couldn't bring myself to turn poor Noah down three times in a row like that. So I accepted. Uh, for those of you that don't know that's a joke, I assure you it is. I am not the most arrogant man on the planet. Uh, well, hopefully you found that to be funny because what I want to talk to you about tonight really isn't very funny. Um, in fact, it's quite frightening. Uh, but I believe it's very prophetic. Now, I don't deal in fear, but I do deal in prophecy. And I happen to know the God who can alleviate fear when you're educated about the issues and you know who to take it to in prayer, right? Somebody could say genetically modified animals. It isn't just, by the way, it isn't just uh, Virginia. It isn't just Ohio. This is happening in every state in the United States right now. In the state that I come from, Missouri, we're raising genetically modified pigs that have human organs. And so I have human DNA running inside these pigs for the purposes of xenotransplantation. But why I liked this Virginia article was... Uh, it's 2000, it's the spring edition from 2010, so it's not quite a year ago that they put this out, uh, but it's quite a lengthy article. You ought to Google this and go get the 2010 spring edition. You can get it from the University of Virginia's website, download it, and read this particular edition because it is all about how we have been genetically modifying organisms, but we are going to genetically modifying humans, and it's going to happen quickly. Professor Michael Schertz, who is the professor of chemical engineering at the uh, University of Virginia, he says it is going to happen. We're going to change human DNA. Who doesn't want to be stronger, thinner, healthier? We need to start figuring out right now how to lay down the rules so that it is used in the most beneficial ways possible. That's what everybody is saying. We've got to develop the rules so that we can make sure that uh, as we begin creating a new form of Nephilim, a new watcher's technology, uh, that we do this so that we become the good little demigods that we are supposed to be. Uh, what? For what purpose? I don't know, to rise up and challenge God. I think this is what we're doing. You know, here's the thing that kind of gets me. And I apologize, I do tend to jump around. And so hopefully you won't get mad and start throwing stuff at me. Um, what does God know that we don't know? Besides a lot, what does he know that we don't know? Why did God put barriers between the species? Why did he order that each kind reproduce after its own kind? And what will man now do in its arrogance as we begin combining ourselves with animals and other synthetic forms of life? We could literally release a kind of prion contamination across species disease for which humanity has absolutely no defenses. It could be a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. It could be a plague of new black death upon the earth. But we are racing into this technology as fast as we possibly can. And you and I, ladies and gentlemen, are already eating genetically modified foods. Uh, in Britain, uh, 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 where the brother was speaking from just a moment ago, and he, uh, he just barely touched on how they're creating ge genetically modified monstrosities over there. Genetic chimeras that are part human, part animal for research purposes. This is happening. They've created humans in Britain that have three genetic parents. They're creating designer children. It's happening there. It's coming here. And as Professor Schertz says, it is going to happen. Whenever the technology exists, man, there's enough of you old Baptist in here. Somebody ought to say amen. Yeah, there you go. And uh, so what I want to talk to you about is the coming technological singularity. I want to talk to you about transhumanism. I want to talk to you about the coming human enhancement revolution. 
For those of you that may not understand what I mean when I use the term transhumanism, I am talking about a very broad cultural movement that is growing like lightning in academia, in halls of education, in U.S. government agencies, in DARPA, in the Department of Defense, in the U.S. Pentagon, among the Jasons, among the Brookings Institute, among academia around the world, in this country, at Stanford University, Oxford University, all are committing huge amounts of resources and now your tax dollars towards a vision what is transhumanism? It is the idea that we are going to use technology now to create a new version of ourselves. We have the power. We have the tools. Six million dollar man? Give me a break. We're going to re align our genetics. We are going to change ourselves. What we are now doing with genetically modified crops, what we are now doing with genetically modified animals, we are going to do with humans. 2.0, a new version of man, an improvement over what God did, they say, and we're going to do it very quickly. Noah told you earlier about Time Magazine's interview with Mr. Singularity himself, Ray Kurzweil, uh, and talking about how mankind will become immortal within the next couple of decades. Well, let me tell you, they believe that vision. There are among them utopians. There are also among them some who are dystopians and who believe this could lead to the eradication of all life on Earth, and yet we're committed to it anyway. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about for the next little bit. Now, I heard earlier today when, uh, I think it might have been Bob Glaze, maybe, or maybe it was Larry Spargamino. Somebody was asking where different people had come from, and there were some of you here that said you came from Ohio, right? It's basically sitting in the same area. Were you there uh, last year at the Science and Supernatural Conference in Ohio? Well, I spoke there, and I was quite certain that most Ohioans uh, were completely unaware that right there in their state, in recent years, Nearly a million dollars. Here's the headline, by the way, right there. Actually, there's the medical news today. Press release right there. Case Law School, that's a law school that's in Ohio, receives $773,000 NIH. That's the National Institute of Health. That's the largest department in the United States that doles out your tax dollars for health-related research. They gave a grant of almost a million dollars to uh, this uh, fellow right here, Professor Maxwell Melman at the Case Law Law School, Western Reserve University, almost a million dollars for one purpose, ladies and gentlemen, and that is to uh, begin creating the guidelines that will be used for establishing public policy, that is, the law, and how will the law be extended towards human, non-humans, in other words, humans that are genetically different than you and I, and will they be protected by the U.S. Constitution, will they be protected by the Bill of Rights, because they are not humans who have received inalienable rights, like our Constitution says we have from our Creator. These are new creations. We'll talk more about that perhaps in a little bit, in a little while, if I don't run out of time, and if I see Noah walk over here and start approaching me, then I know I'm running out of time. But that was specifically what this grant was given for. Now, I had been looking for the finality of this report. Uh, Professor Melman led a team of 24, uh, uh, over a 24-month period of law professors, bioethicists, geneticists, uh, other interested parties who were qualified and could be part of that team for the express purpose of developing the guidelines so that the government will know under what conditions we can begin to genetically alter the human race for the next step in human evolution and also the next step in uh, medicine, it says, according to the report in there somewhere, genetic uh, alterations of humans. And so I waited for the report. The report was not forthcoming. Uh, they concluded this report about eight, or this research about 18 months ago. But whereas I have not yet been able to find the report that was supposed to come forward, I did notice this that Professor Maxwell Melman, who led this research, uh, left Case Law School, began traveling the United States of America, and right now he's going to uh, colleges and universities and he's giving two lectures. One is called uh, Directed evolution, public policy and enhancement, and the second is called transhumanism and the future of democracy. So guess what, ladies and gentlemen, there is a plan, and it is unfolding, and it is unfolding quickly, and your tax dollars are being used to fund the very scheme that is going to be used to recalibrate humanity. But if you're sitting in this building, and you might happen to be a little bit envious of those Ohioans 
Never fear, the spring 2010 University of Virginia magazine on reinventing life. Um, how far is the University of Virginia, by the way, from here? Anybody know? Long way, two, three hundred miles. Oh, so it doesn't affect you in Bristol? Well, guess what? Do some research and you'll find out that farms around you are raising genetically modified crops.